Greetings, I'm Wes Dehain, and today I'm going to spend some time showing you how to create your own New England IPA recipe on the brewery. So we'll go through that step by step uh, to show you how that's done. Um, and if you want a good uh, introduction into how to use the recipe creator on the brewery, you also might want to check out uh, Thomas's video. He has a good video on the basics going through all the steps, which we'll also go through here, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on uh, how to build this sort of recipe. So let's get started. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, click Create Recipe at the bottom uh, after you've uh, booted up your brewery. Um, and you want to give that a name, so I guess we'll just call this uh, NEIPA uh, for New England IPA. And hit Enter. Done. And then it'll come up with this screen which gives you a few different options to uh, look at the details of your brew, um, set up your ingredients, uh, set up your brew process, and fermentation and so forth, right? So first step, let's start with some of the ingredients. Okay, so now we're going to add our grains in the fermentable section. So we'll start with the uh, base malt that we want to use for um, this particular brew. So we'll use a um, <coughs> um, Canadian two-row pale uh, malt uh, for this one. So let's um, add that in. I'll do a quick search for that. Uh, all right, so there's Canadian Bell 2 row. So we'll select that one. We're going to go with about 12 pounds. So that's about 5,443 grams. Enter that in. Uh, the next grain that we're going to add is a little bit of um, crystal malt or caramel malt. Uh, we'll go with 15L uh, to keep the color a little on the lighter side. We don't want um, the SRM to be too high for a brew like this, so we're going to target or keep it around 6. So I'll search for that. Uh, so we'll look for crystal. Uh, that's the 10L. We're going to go with the 15L. Select that, and not very much of this, um, it's only about 12 ounces or 340 grams, enter that. And then lastly, um, to give uh, the brew a little bit of more haziness, um, we'll add a little bit of torrified wheat. Um, and this is something you could experiment with as well, you could try upping the wheat or adding oats or things like that as well, so this is something that you can always play around with, um, but for this particular recipe, I think we'll just um, we'll go with torrified wheat. So we'll do a quick search for that. There's torrified barley, torrified wheat, um, and this one will also be about 12 ounces or 340 grams. And we'll enter that in. And for this recipe, that's all we've got on the grain bill. So uh, just to recap, we've got um, 5,443 grams of the pale row, pale two row, uh, Canadian pale two row. 340 grams of uh, 15L crystal and uh, 340 grams of the torrified wheat. So now we're all done with our um, um, grain bill. And so the next step uh, is we can move over um, and put our uh, hops in. So uh, for this one, since we're going to have most of our hops in the uh, whirlpooling uh, stage, um, when we're cooling down our wort after the boil, boil. Um, we're only going to put a little bit of hops in hop cage one. Um, so I'm going to uh, use, I think here I'm actually going to go with Apollo hops. So let's do a quick search for Apollo. So there we go, Apollo. I'm going to put about half an ounce or only 14 grams because we don't want um, too much bitterness uh, coming from the boil hops. We just want a little bit from that and everything else is going to come from the whirlpooling in terms of um, flavor and, and any additional bitterness uh, coming from there. So so now we've got that entered in. Um, the next thing I'm going to do um, here is in the second hop cage, um, we don't have an option for it here. Our brewery doesn't have an option for it here yet, but I'm just going to talk about it while we're on this menu. So in the second hop cage, I'm going to actually add some um, turbinado sugar 
Uh, so that's just, you know, raw um, kind of sugar crystals. They kind of have that, that brownie sort of color to it. So we're going to actually add some of that into Hop Cage 2. Um, and that'll just basically add some more sugars to the wort as, as we're brewing. Uh, and that'll get dissolved, you know, during the boil. We'll, we'll circulate that on Hop Cage 2 for the last, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And that's going to bring our uh, original gravity up and then add a little bit to our fin finishing uh, ABV uh, or alcohol level for this, this brew. So there's nothing to add here right now, um, so we'll leave it as is. But when we're programming uh, the brewing uh, process, we'll make sure that we enable Hop Cage 2 to circulate wort through there uh, during the last 10 minutes or so. So as far as ingredients for now, we're basically done. So we'll go back to the main menu here. So we've entered all our ingredients. So now we'll go to our brewing steps next. Um, so the first thing we'll do is um, start setting up our mash in water volume and temperature. So one thing I want to mention here, um, in the brewery manual there's a good table that you want to reference to kind of give some guidance as to what's a good balance of uh, mash water volume and sparge water volume depending on the total grain bill that you've got for your recipe. So you can go back to the ingredients that um, we entered here, look at your total grain bill and look at that table that Brewy has in, in the manual and the documentation and kind of use that as a guideline. Um, so for my particular grain bill, um, a reasonable, uh, reasonable um, mash water volume is sitting in the neighborhood of uh, 15 liters. I'm actually going to do about uh, 15.3. 15, 15 um, so I will enter that right here. And you can even see at the top, kind of Brewery's giving a recommendation given the grain bill we've entered. So I'm going to go with 15.3. We'll enter that in. I like to have um, you know, a little bit on, I like to err on a little bit on the higher side for mash water. Uh, especially for larger grain bills, so you don't end up with a stuck mash, and you know you're getting good water circulation through uh, during your mashing steps uh, with brewery. So, so we'll go with 15.3. Um, now, mashing water, I'm going to do about 55 degrees for uh, initial mashing temperature. Um, now, here we can also do our add our sparging. Uh, so, I like to sparge at the end around 78 degrees. So, we'll enter that in. I'm going to do at least 20 minutes of sparging. You could go a little bit more if you want, um, but I'll go with 20 here for the purposes of this recipe. And then in terms of volume, I'm targeting this recipe to kind of be a finishing volume in the neighborhood of 19 to 20 liters. Um, so for sparging water, I'm going to go with about 12.8. And again, you can see Brewy at the top is making a recommendation, you know, somewhere between 0 and 13.7, um, which you don't want to go over so you don't uh, have to worry about any boil um, um, spillovers or anything like that. So we'll enter that in for our sparge water. So that's all our volumes and initial uh, mash water temperatures and sparge water temperatures. So the next step will be setting up our whole mash process. So we've set the mash mash in or the initial. I like to set up a multi-step process. So we're starting at 55 degrees C with the mash in. So I'm going to add a first step that's at the same temperature. I always like to do this, start at the same temperature, uh, whoops, sorry, I entered in the time. <laughs> I'm going to do this for 10 minutes. So 10 minutes uh, and temperature, as I was saying, I like to put the first step at the same temperature as what we set in the uh, mash-in uh, portion, just so that um, you don't run into any um, issues or anything like that. So I always like to start it off there. Um, so now we've got that first step, now I'm going to add a second step. So now I want to raise the temperature up to about, go to around 69 degrees Celsius. And this will be kind of my main uh, mashing step. So I'll do this for a full hour. So full 60 minutes on this step. And then I'll do a mash out step um, at higher temperature. So I'll raise it up to about 76 degrees Celsius. And then we'll mash that out for a good 30 minutes or so. Um, I like to do mashing, a total mashing time that's, uh, you know, well above an hour. Try and extract as much of the sugars as we can out of those grains and, and get a little bit better efficiency. 
and we'll talk about the efficiency a little bit later. Um, but this pretty much sets up all my mashing steps now, so we're done there. Um, then the next step, we'll go over to the hopping um, menu. Uh, so as you recall, we had uh, set some hops in hop cage number one, the Apollo hops, and it's showing up here on the on the brewery screen. So we'll do we'll uh, I'll, I'll do delayed hopping. So I'll let the oh, modify. Uh, we'll do delayed hopping to let the um, let the wort uh, really get boiling a little bit before we start um, circulating uh, the wort through the hops. So I'll usually do anywhere between five or ten minutes, not too long, just to kind of let a good rolling boil uh, get going. Um, and then on the uh, Apollo hops, so we're going to do that for the full boil time, 60 minutes. So on hop cage one, I've set that for 60 minutes. And then for hop cage two, so again, that's where I mentioned we'll have the, the raw sugar that we'll add in there. Um, and by the way, the amount of raw sugar we'd stick in there uh, will be 12 ounces, so about 340 grams of that sugar. Um, so we'll stick that into hop cage two, and I'll put that in, say, for the last 15 minutes of the boil, give it enough time to dissolve and circulate and mix with the wort. And then that's it for hopping. So then we're done that step, and then we'll go over to the last menu here, which is really just the target temperature for cooling. Um, so we'll set that up as well. I usually like to use around 25 degrees C or so. Um, that way it cools a little faster. Uh, if you happen to have somewhat warmer uh, temperature tap water, um, then you won't uh, be, be stuck waiting a long time. Um, and then this gets it uh, well within the range of you know the typical ale uh, type yeasts that you might be using. Um, to ferment this later. So, so we'll stick with that, 25 degrees C for cooling. So now we've got the whole brewing setup done, so we can go back to our uh, main menu here. So we've entered all our ingredients, we've entered in all our brew steps. So now the next thing we can set up is the uh, fermentation. And we'll add some details here. So I'm going to rack this. Um, I'm not going to be bottling this, I'm going to keg it. Uh, we'll enter the length of time for fermentation, so I usually put about three weeks. Um, and uh, the temperature um, that I'm going to use here will be about 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, I, f I usually ferment in my basement where the temperature is very consistent, uh, so I don't have to um, spend a lot of effort on uh, temperature control or anything like that. Um, so in terms of storage, we'll select, I'm going to put it in a plastic bucket for fermentation. So we'll enter that in. And then last but not least, the most important part is uh, picking and setting up your, your yeast. So in this case, um, I'll select yeast, um, and then we'll pick the type of yeast here. So for these type of styles, for New England style, um, there's all kinds of really great yeasts to pick from. Uh, a couple of my favorites that I've used in the past um, include things like um, Giga yeast, there's a Vermont ale yeast that they have that is very very nice and I've used that in a couple different uh, brews uh, with this type of style. Um, another really good one uh, from White Labs is a, again a Vermont ale uh, style yeast uh, which is really good. And then another one that you can also use which we'll use for this recipe is um, a Y yeast so it's a London ale so we'll do a quick uh, search for that. And we can see that's popping up right here, London Ale 3, the 1318 um, from Y East. So we'll use that in this brew. Um, so now we've got everything set up in the uh, fermentation portion here. So now at this stage we've entered in our ingredients, we've set up all our brewing steps, we've set up the fermentation. So now we can go into details and we can start looking at uh, what brewery has calculated for this particular brew. So. Um, so it's showing an efficiency right now, 55%. So this is something uh, that brewery just calculates based on the total um, grain um, weight that you're putting in, the total grain mass. Um, so it's calculating based on that what sort of efficiency um, you should expect. So in this particular case, I've got quite a bit of grain. Um, I mean, I think it's well over six kilos of, of grain. Um, so it's showing an efficiency of 55% here. Um, 
in practice, uh, I've found I can get you know closer to 65%, uh, sometimes as much as 70, really depending on um, you know what you do with that grain. Uh, if you stick it in a single grain bag and you know you're occasionally uh, agitating and stirring it and moving it around, you know you might get um, you might get up upwards of 60, 65. You might be able to push it even a little bit higher if you. Um, do things like the double bag method, splitting the grain bill between two bags, which I think uh, uh, Dennis has done before. Uh, Cookie on on uh, the forums that you might you might have seen uh, him posting about that. So I think that's um, a really good way uh, to go if you're having efficiency problems. But at least this way, Brewery is giving you a rough guideline of what the efficiency uh, should come out to be. In this case, our batch size is uh, it's 19. 0.78 liters, so that's my total volume I should be getting out at the end uh, based on the mash and sparge volumes we did. Now here's where there'll be a little bit of uh, discrepancy, so in terms of the uh, original gravity, so it's brewery's showing about 1.051 and that's again based on this 55% efficiency number. Um, if you get better efficiency, obviously your OG will go up. The other thing that this uh, OG calculations not including is it's not including that that uh, 12 ounces of sugar that we're going to stick in hop cage two. So that would actually bring your OG up um, if we assume the 55% efficiency is right. That'll bring your OG up a few points. You'll get up to about 1.057 or so. Um, so that sh that ought to bring the ABV up um, to about um, you know the prediction here is about 4.9. That should bring it up to maybe about 5.7. Um, you can see the final gravity here, Brewery's estimating is about 1.014 um, based on this yeast and all that kind of stuff. So, And if you uh, if you compare these numbers to some brewing software that a lot of people might be using, like Beersmith or other tools, it comes out very, very close. And, and in fact, I think that's a, a great tool to have at your disposal. Um, um, I personally use Beersmith and works really well for me and I get good agreement uh, between calculations in beer smith, smith and calculations uh, from the brewery um, once you account for these uh, differences like the sugar and stuff like that. So so this gives you a really good rundown of um, what to expect out of your brew and uh, actually even the IBUs are predicted here as well. Um, that'll be the IBUs coming from just the um, Apollo hops we put in hop cage one for the boil. It won't be accounting for any of the IBUs that we'll be adding when we do uh, whirlpooling. Um, in this uh, brew, so so that's really it. That's the uh, that's the whole whole recipe. And now, basically, you're ready to to add uh, all your ingredients in the bag and add your hops and add the sugar and hop cage two and hit brew, and you're ready to go. Um, so next step, I'll just talk a little bit about the um, the uh, whirlpooling and the uh, dry hopping uh, for this particular brew, and uh, that'll wrap up this recipe. Okay, now that we've got the recipe all entered in, um, you could actually load up the machine as we were saying and, and get it brewing. Um, and then the next key time or spot um, in your brew process would be uh, the whirlpool hops that we would do for this brew. So again, with New England IPAs, that sort of style, very little, if and, and in some cases none, uh, hops in the boil and all your hops in the whirlpooling as you're cooling the wort down. So in this case, what we would do, um, you'll go through your whole brew press process. Uh, you'll want to keep an eye on it when you're about to start the cooling process. So as brewery starts cooling your wort down, um, you'll want to stop or pause the cooling. Um, so I, I personally use the pause function that's on brewery as it's cooling. I'll hit pause. Once I hit in the neighborhood of about 70 degrees Celsius or so, or around 160 Fahrenheit, um, that's really what, where you want to start doing your uh, hop whirlpooling. You'll want to have some kind of vessel um, that you can put in brewery to do your hop whirlpooling. So I like to use something like this, a nice big stainless steel basket with a very fine mesh um, filter on it. Uh, it's easy to clean after. Um, and easy to use in your brewery. Um, so you can load this up with your hops and then once you've paused uh, the temperature cooling cycle uh, at brewery around that 70 degrees Celsius mark, 
you can stick all your whirlpool hops in there and then just just let it sit and it's nice to kind of give it a swirl around kind of agitate it once in a while but I like to whirlpool for at least around 30 minutes you know, I want to whirlpool those hops um, if you want some more details on that I have an article that I wrote up um, on how to do this with the brewery uh, with some details and some other pictures so that might be a good reference for you if you're looking at on how to do that but in this particular case um, for this recipe what I uh, usually put in uh, for this one I do about two and a half ounces or 71 grams of Simcoe about an ounce or 28 grams of Centennial hops about 0.75 ounces or 21 grams of Apollo uh, 0.75 ounces or 21 grams of Columbus and then about 0.75 ounces or 21 grams of Comet hops and we stick that all in there um, and whirlpool that for at least 30 minutes and then for this recipe in the last 10 minutes of the whirlpool so after you've had that first chunk of hops going in for about 20 minutes in the last 10 minutes I add another 21 grams or 0.75 ounces of uh, Simcoe hops um, and once you're done the whirl whirlpool you can you can pull this out if you want um, and and uh, get rid of the hops I personally just like to leave it in I'll leave it in there and let brewery continue finish cooling because you're still getting some circulation when you've resumed that cooling process and you get just a little bit more hop, hop whirl, whirlpool in there. The only thing that might do is affect your uh, IBU level because um, again you're gonna get you're gonna extract a little bit of bitterness um, from the hops when you're whirl whirlpooling but since most of the alpha acids that are getting uh, extracted from the hops aren't being isomerized uh, because you're doing this at much, much lower temperatures it won't pick up that much but there's ways to estimate it in tools like Beersmith and, and that sort of thing but I think it's probably more of a, an art um, in, in figuring that out but anyway um, so that's really the, uh, the whirlpooling process and now once your wort's cooled you're ready to drain and, and pitch your yeast so that's it for uh, this recipe and going through uh, how to enter it in on the brewery uh, I guess the last thing I would mention uh, in closing is just the dry hop schedule for this uh, particular um, recipe. So I like to do um, a five day uh, dry hopping. So in the last five days um, before you're ready to, to rack it into a keg or a bottle or whatever. Um, for five days I'll throw in two ounces of um, uh, two ounces or 56 grams of Centennial, two ounces or 56 grams of Simcoe, an ounce or 28 grams of Apollo, an ounce, 28 grams of Columbus, and then half an ounce or 14 grams of Comet uh, hops. So you let that dry hop for five days, and in the final two days of dry hopping, I add another burst of Simcoe, so about another ounce and a half or 42 grams of Simcoe. Let that finish up in the last two days, and then you're ready to ready to um, get that kegged or, or bottled and then uh, enjoy and the last thing I would mention last two points um, New England IPAs I find you always want to drink them fresher it's actually I find they taste much better not aging them very long you'll get more of that hop flavor um, and uh, aroma which might dissipate somewhat over time um, so I find these are much better to drink very fresh um, so once it's carved up, I, I would say start trying it out right away. <laughs> um, and then lastly, I'll add a small article uh, to go along with this uh, video, uh, which will kind of detail the recipe just uh, in case anyone wants that for reference. And uh, feel free to ask any questions. Thanks for watching. Bye now.